So, hello everyone. We are live on Facebook today with uh, uh, several very interesting people that you are going to meet. Uh, my name is Leora. I work for ASI as the um, member manager, ex um, experience manager. Uh, and we are going to talk about grapes today. Today, one is just as likely to hear tableside banter between sommeliers and guests on the likes of Sino Mauro, Sinestri and Baga, as one is Cabernet, Merlot and Chardonnay. With information available literally at our fingertips, today's wine consumers are better informed than perhaps ever before. And in today's pursuit of authenticity and individuality, many indigenous grapes are finally getting their deserved day in the sun. When the seminal work on the subject Wine Grapes, co-authored with Dr. Jose uh, Williamos, who you can see here today with us, was released in 2012, 1,368 varieties were cited. If that book was released today, Dr. Williamos would have said, has said that a number would be at least 1,500. Not only is science improving to identify and preserve varietals, but the pressure is on, in, um, is on in terms of climate change to explore alternatives in regions like Bordeaux, where the traditional, albeit international, varieties are no longer thriving. For our discussion today, we are honored to host five esteemed guests from every stage of the wine industry chain. And together we will explore the renaissance of these indigenous varieties and debate how sommeliers can best communicate them to their guests. With us today, we have renowned Sicilian winemaker, whom I'm sure many of you know from earlier on, Ariana Occhipinti, fresh out of 40 days of harvesting. Hi, Ariana. Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. inviting me. Oh, we're happy to have you. We have a distinguished ampolographer, Dr. Jose Vuyamos, uh, directly with us from Geneva, Switzerland. Hi, Jose. Hello, everyone. And we have Mark Squires from one of the world's leading wine guys, Robert Parker, wine advocate. Hi, Mark. Good morning. And we have Master Sommelier and former championships of the ASI Best Sommelier of Europe contest from 2008, if I'm not mistaken, Isabel. Hi, Isa. From Hi, Turkey today, well, from Turkey, obviously, but with us from the UK. And representing ASI's partner wines of Portugal, we have Virsao Viana Junior MW, so a master wine who is a Brazilian board and owner of his own consultancy firm, also based in the UK. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Great to have you all with us. And we're looking forward to an hour of a lot of info from you guys on all these indigenous grape varieties. Um, with the climate uh, predestined for organic viticulture and a long history of indigenous varieties, few regions have seen such a renaissance as Sicily. Ariana, you returned to Sicily in 2004 and started with one hectare of vineyard. Today you have 28 dedicated almost entirely to indigenous varieties like Frappato, Nero d'Avola, Cerasulo de Vittoria, and Zibibu. I love that name, Zibibu. <laughs> Can you talk a bit about why you have chosen to focus on these varieties and uh, how? And before we go any further, let me also say thank you so much for taking the time to do this when I know you are probably just completely exhausted after harvest. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Hi, everybody again. Uh, yeah, it's I'm a little bit exhausted as uh, every vineyard on after the harvest, but uh, we also use the harvest to recharge ourselves because we it's so something we need. So we arrive to the harvest after spring and summer that uh, this vintage were very difficult in Sicily because very dry. So I arrived already almost tired, but uh, the, the harvest is something I, I need to recharge myself, to restart the, a new year that starts now, just uh, the day after the harvest. So uh, yes, I decided to come back to Sicily after my study in uh, winemaking, uh, spend in Milano. Um, and I always say that uh, for me, it was very important to, to know and study about uh, when making a viticulture, to understand better um, grape in general, wine in general, and also uh, I dedicate part of my last exam to the study of indigenous grape also in Sicily. 
So when I come back to Sicily, I was uh, like 22. And uh, my desire was to discover and a, a kind of a different face of uh, Sicilian production. Because we were coming uh, as in all world uh, to a good period, uh, but um, which more international grape were becoming famous. So Sicily was becoming a kind of new California. Remember, I can't forget a page of uh, Gambaro Ross of 20 years ago with the big title, Sicily like new California, no? That uh, was, uh, was good in a side because Sicily was uh, abandoning finally the idea to be only a place where for the production of uh, wine for blend or wine alcoholic to, to blend other wine from Europe or Italy. But in the same time, uh, we were not becoming famous for our historical things, but uh, also for international grape. So it was very important the period that came later, which producer start to discover again uh, the indigenous grape in Sicily. And uh, thanks to Nero Davolo at the beginning, Sicily was known in all world. And um, people discovered that Sicily is not only a unique island, but is made by different, different uh, small region. So now we can divide Sicily in uh, uh, different appellation. My personal appellation is Cerasuolo di Vittoria, where the principal grape are Nero Davolo and Frappato. But Sicily is also made by uh, Nocera, Nerello Mascalese, um, hundred of indigenous red and indigenous white grape. And this show the real character of our, our, our land. Consider Sicily as a, a, a unique island, maybe in the world, I don't know, where we have also four months of harvest because the condition of climate and the many different indigenous grape we have puts our period of harvest very long. So at the end of July, people start with some white grape they spend all August with the white indigenous grape also September. End of September, for example, and during September, we start the red variety. End of September is the period of Cerasuolo di Vittoria, but we also finish in Mount Etna, sometimes uh, until first days of November. So it's a special place because there is only 250 kilometers of um, between a cape to another cape in the highland with so many different condition varieties uh, historical tradition so it's a very unique place where to make wine in my opinion i'm very fortunate to work with the um, maybe the the um, most more elegant grape uh, uh, with other couple, for example, of red, the are Frappato Nero Davola. Thanks to the limestone rock we have in Victoria, because we are at the feet of the Blay Mountains. So in um, hundred of, no, million of years ago, Sicily was covered by the sea. Every time the sea retired, left a little layer of sand. So Vittoria is made by different layer of rock now and a small uh, layer like 40, 40, 30 centimeter of red sand. In different, in the different district, we can have different kind of uh, expression of Frappato and Erodavola. But especially in this place where limestone is the most important material we have in the soil, fortunately this grape makes wine very elegant. So even though we are in the southeast of Sicily, we are in a place where we have always very high acidity, low pH and very elegant wine. I think it's extremely uh, fantastic that you and many with you, obviously, uh, are, are showing off all these indigenous varietals in your wines. And I don't know how many local varieties there are. How many do you plant? I, I have around six in my vineyards. 
and I only want to uh, grow indigenous uh, because they adapt uh, better themselves to the place. In fact, uh, I think now we are going a very dry moment of, uh, and difficult because uh, consider that uh, I'm coming, uh, this harvest arrived after a period of, between January and September of only 160 millimeters of rain. So it's important to focus ourselves in indigenous grape because they are the only that in the past years, they adapted. They suffer, of course, especially I don't use irrigation system, for example. And also for this, I, I see that it's only Frappato, Nero Davola, Moscato, Valessandri, Grillo, they are stronger than the other. They don't produce a lot, but they resist. So they are able to uh, resist and compete uh, to the uh, to this very hard condition. So yeah. I, I only find this solution uh, for the future. So there is no other solution. <laughs> well, I think that's a, a, a great uh, mindset anyway to to take care of your local varieties in that way. But Jose, you put together wine grapes in 2012 with uh, Jancis Robinson and Julia Harding, both masters of wine. How have you seen the interest and reception toward indigenous grapes change over the 10 last years? What do you think has been the factors or driving that? Well, <clears throat> we must start before that. We published wine grapes in 2012, but it was in uh, answer to a necessity a necessity to have information about the indigenous grape varieties all over the world. The previous book that did such a um, work was published in the early uh, 1901 and 1910. It was en pelographie, or only in French. And there was a gap. And this gap was the answer of the public demand of more information about local grape varieties. Um, maybe Ariana is too young, but in the 80s, in, 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 uh, in, in Italy, for example, in other places, people, wine growers, were ashamed of the grandfather's varieties, and they wanted to plant Cabernet, Merlot, whatever, to be, to be more international, to, be, to have more visibility. And I think that this trend was a mistake, because the only thing that local people can do best is what they have since centuries. These local varieties, either in Italy, in Portugal, in Switzerland, where I live, they have gone through various climate changes and they have survived until now. And I think that's the best way for the people is to plant what they have. I hope that we played a little role with wine grapes to help some people rediscover or regain confidence in what their ancestors did plant. And I could witness the creation of some group or associations to safeguard and promote indigenous varieties. Like, for example, in France, the Centre d'Empelographie Alpine, it's Alpine Empelographic Center. I was part of the um, founder groups in honor of the huge work of Pierre Gallet, one of the uh, greatest empelographers of the, the 20th century. Also, my good friend Jean-Luc Etievant, uh, French engineer, he went to one of my conferences in, 20, in 2012, and he was convinced that there was something to do to protect and promote varieties from all around the Mediterranean Sea, including Sicily and all the other countries. He created wine mosaic, for example. And more recently, uh, my friend Loïc Pasquet, maybe you know him from Bordeaux, he makes the most expensive wine in the world. Uh, he knows about marketing a lot, but, but he's a good friend as well. He, he wants to, to reintroduce the very old grape varieties in Bordeaux. Of course, it doesn't mean that the, the, the bottle would, cut, would cost $30,000. But anyway, that's part of him. And together uh, with him, we created an association called Franc de Pied. It's a French word to mean ungrafted. And this is a way to promote the old style of ungrafted old varieties in their local places. And it, it's, um, it's a trend that has been also witnessed, for example, by the book of um, Jason Wilson, God Forsaken Grapes, that had a huge success, especially in the US. And he traveled the ancient world in search of the obscure and unique and 
people are really curious and attracted to what is unique and local to the place. And you, you ask about the, the, the factors driving that. Uh, I think not only with wine, but with food in general, there is an awareness raising of the importance of drinking and eating local products and uh, to reduce the impact on the environment, for example, to support local economy and so on, and also to have a sense of place, the expression of terroir. So I'm very happy to see that. If we played a little role with wine grapes, I'm very happy. Well, I'm sure you didn't play a little role and not only for winemakers and uh, but also especially for sommeliers. Uh, I know for myself and probably for Isa as well. I mean, having a, a, a encyclopedia like that of grapes uh, is a huge help both in restaurants when you're exploring new varieties and obviously when you're in competitions uh, it's super important to know about all these things so go for with with more more varietals and more updates and everything i think that's great we, so, we, we are sorry. we are think we are thinking of a second edition one day looking forward to that you <laughs> first part because it takes a long time i've heard <laughs> updates. oh yes 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 um, dear Seo, hi. You're, uh, hi. Uh, one of the reasons wine producers are returning to indigenous or ancestral varieties um, as a reaction to climate change too. Like Sicily, Portugal's uh, allegiance with over 250 indigenous varietals um, to the autochton gives it an advantage over other countries and regions, perhaps more broadly accepted international varieties of the 80s, 90s, 2000s. And keeping this in mind, how do you feel Portugal as a whole is positioned for future climate changes? Well, I think Portugal is well positioned, but having 250 varieties is both uh, an advantage and also a challenge. It is a challenge because it's quite difficult to, to communicate about each and every variety individually. But uh, is, is it a great advantage? Obviously, this is what we hear. We're talking about uh, diversity, and that's what Portugal has. And, uh, and aside from that, is the, it's a very well positioned to overcome the, the threat of, of, of climate change. So one thing that uh, most people don't really uh, understand and realize, yes, there are 250 uh, grape varieties in Portugal, but I have written an article recently about Riga Nacional, and I was I was quite shocked to to learn there were almost 200 clones of Riga Nacional. So there is a huge uh, diversity, even of clone diversity. Uh, some are, some we know about it, some are, are yet to be explored. Uh, going across the border to to Spain, or a, a variety that is planted in Spain and Portugal, Tinta Rizzo or Aragonese. There are over 250 clones that I know of, there are possibly even more. Some are very low yielding, six tons. Some are very high yielding, 17, almost 20 tons. Some are able to retain acidity uh, better than others, like clone 54, which is, will be good for, for in terms of uh, climate change. Some, have, some give a lower alcohol. So there's a lot of things that we, uh, we need, to, as yet, we need to, to understand and explore. Uh, the real advantage that Portugal has is that the majority of those uh, varieties and clones, they have been studied, they have been catalogued, and they, are, they have been preserved. They, they have a very competent uh, institution called Povid, and they do a, a, a great work. So I think in general terms, having those everything organized and having the, the wealth of clones puts Portugal in a very, very good place. So it's very good for good news for the consumer that we're able to we'll have some exciting wines uh, for the future. Um, and then I think this is why Portugal is pretty well um, uh, positioned. I must agree. I've actually spent the past two weeks in Portugal, just arrived back home yesterday. And uh, I had for the first time in my life a sparkling wine, a Blanc de Noir of Tourigue Nationale. Yeah. And it was made in traditional method and it was from 2010. It was wow. remarkable. So there's a, a lot. Of I, go to, I go to Portugal very often and I'm sure Mark is the same. It doesn't matter. Every time we go there, we, we discover something new. Absolutely. 
And that's good because my next question is to you, Mark. When it comes to, to wine scoring, classic regions such as Bordeaux, Burgundy, Barolo, and so on, uh, they have decades and even centuries of producing a broadly similar style of wine, making comparatives easy. However, with the rise of small scale production of indigenous varieties, there are few, if any, benchmarks. So how do you uh, suggest critics and sommeliers judge these indigenous uh, ancestral varieties? How do, you, how do you prepare for that? Well, Dirsu just made a really good point. And as he says, even when you're dealing with a fairly traditional, well-known grape like Tariga, you don't actually always know what's going on there either. At Sograp, in fact, they told me, I think, over 300 clones of Tariga National at one point in their lab, tested, you know, so on and so forth. But you ask an impossible question. My, my view in life as in wine is the answer is usually it depends. Uh, it's shades of gray, it's line drawing. And an example I thought of, since you were nice enough not to surprise us with these questions, was Tinta Grossa and Alan Pesco. It's made by Paulo Lariano. And when this wine comes across your desk, here's a grape you've never heard of before. Here's a grape that seems interesting. It's made by a competent and well-known winemaker. And it's the only monovarietal offering of its type in Portugal what's it supposed to be? And really, my first advice would be try and get a few extra wines. When I came to Portugal, if somebody was going to show me a Tariga Nacional, I wanted to see 20 or 30 of them to get an idea of what the range was like. Because even in established regions, we have this old school versus new school and all of these ideological combat going on. Um, but when you get a wine that has one producer, <laughs> and it's the only label in the country, you don't really have that choice. Um, and you don't have that choice a lot of times. So what am I going to do with it? Paulo Luriano is giving us his vision of this grape. Is this the only possible vision? I don't know. Um, so you fall back on what you know best. Um, there are objective touch points in judging wine. Uh, first, is the flavor profile different? No, not really. I mean, it has its distinctiveness, but it's not a weird wine that's going to be very off-putting, like some people don't like those herbaceous Sauvignon Blancs. Um, does it have freshness? Yes. Can it show structure, good tannins, good concentration? Yes. And at that point, how does it perform as a wine? And it doesn't really need too many exceptions to how you normally judge it. It's not quite as routine as Tariga Franca because, say, in the back of your mind is always this concept that what if he's making it weirdly and this isn't what it's supposed to be? Um, and I don't know the answer to that either. But I would say to all producers with indigenous grapes, and Ariana Malika speaks highly of it, uh, you have to have the ability to stay the course. It's not just a question of climate change, although that's a big issue. It's also a question of maintaining your culture, your identity, and creating an identity if you don't have one. And when I started reviewing Portugal, all the producers would flock around me and say, what do we do to break into the market? What's the solution? And I go, there isn't ever going to be one great flash moment again in wine because there are too many producers coming from everywhere. The market is too crowded, stay the course, slow and steady. And one way to do it is to develop your own identity. Make things only you make. Make things you're good at. Make things you know how to make. And the comment about some of the producers 20, 30 years ago being ashamed of their local grapes is actually quite true, especially I saw that in Greece. Um, stay the course. Make indigenous grapes, and it will work itself out in the end. And the only people you will terrorize while doing that is me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you made a few uh, very good points there, Mark. And also, I think, well, obviously it takes uh, many years experience, like you have to, to know really uh, what to look for and also to set these standards of what does a wine need to have to be able to kind of understand it, even if there's just one 
producer making that specific grape. Um, and uh, yeah, I've tasted some of the wines from Paolo Loreano and uh, well, it's interesting to taste something that nobody else makes, absolutely. Isa. This uh, move to indigenous varietals is, uh, is both a great opportunity for some, but also provides some challenge, I guess, especially when it comes to communications to the consumer. Um, what do you see as the sommelier's role in promoting indigenous and ancestral varietals? Do, do psalms have an obligation to increase focus on this? Um, and do you see this as a challenge to incorporating these wines onto list? Obviously, you are uh, from Turkey originally, where you yeah. have a lot of indigenous grapes. Yeah, I think I, I personally think that um, there isn't a sort of an obligation on sommeliers to promote indigenous varieties. However, um, there are restaurant concepts, there are different wine uh, operation concepts that they need to find a way of uh, fitting these wines in and giving them a space that they deserve. And I think where we are, for example, uh, the way we have structured our wine list is that I didn't want to create a list that is uh, very traditional in style. I wanted to create something that focused on viticultural history, which goes back, as you know, seven, 8,000 uh, proven uh, history. So my wine list starts with uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Turkey. And then it follows the sort of chronological journey of wine um, to the modern day. And I estimate that humans will be able to make wine in Mars by 3000 AD. So there is actually a section on my wine list saying that. And, but joking aside, I think the, the international varieties can give you a point of difference, but also it can, it can open uh, windows that the wine drinkers, let's face it, you know, if you eat steak every day, even though you like it the most, you'll get bored of it. You know, if you eat chicken every day, you'll get bored of it. So it is allowing the wine drinkers, the flavors, aroma profiles that they would have otherwise not encountered. And it's true that these indigenous varieties, um, they do provide a new world of flavors and aromas. I think that's, that's just purely from the Epicurean point of view, it's an important as, uh, asset they have got. Then what they also have, um, and it makes sommelier's life a bit easy as well, they often come with stories, uh, stories that people have never heard of, stories that it, it comes with uh, human history, it comes with viticultural history, it comes with location history. And these are important stories to share and to to help people to understand the background of it as well. Um, in Turkey, for example, even though I live uh, in UK, I have been living in UK for many years. What's important is that uh, in Turkey from around 2008, I really have campaigned against, not against, but for the local varieties to be planted and better understood. By then at the time, the local producers knew more about Cabernet Sauvignon or Syrah than they did their own great varieties. And I said, if you need to compete in international stage, you need to go there with your own varieties. And it gives an opportunity to producers from outside the very established wine countries to go into international stage and have a ready audience. Because most, sophisticated wine loving countries with strong wine markets, they also have very open-minded consumers. In UK, for example, we have absolutely zero problem in showing people grape varieties they never heard of, uh, from be that from Armenia, be that from Georgia or Turkey. So it's been doing very well for us. And, and also it keeps the approach fresh and I am always on the lookout for another grape variety that I don't have. One of the things I keep looking is, have I got this variety on the list yet? It, it's, that's one of my, I wish I had more space to put more, but 
you know, working on it. I'm so happy to hear that that it's no problem to say sell local grape varieties or indigenous grape varieties from from I wouldn't say new wine countries. They're ancient wine countries, but countries that uh, finally again are seeing the the light of day because. In Norway, we just for the, I'm from Norway. For the first time, we have a Mediterranean restaurant that has a wine list purely based on wines from the Levant and from Eastern Southeastern Europe. Uh, yeah. It's much more difficult here than in the UK, seeing that in the UK you probably have a more diversity in in people from different countries from all over the world. But it's obviously very important to have ambassadors like you who know grape varieties, who have tasted a lot, because you need to, to guide the guest into, I mean, the guests will probably never by themselves say that, okay, I've never tried Emir from, from uh, Turkey. That's what I want to drink today. They will ask your opinion. Absolutely. And, and they are very open-minded on that. And if you recommend something, they are more than happy to give it a try once. I, I guess as the sommelier, what they need to be careful of is that uh, not to fall into the trap of, just because it's different, put it on the list. It needs to deliver. And if it delivers, then you have done your job by introducing it once. They'll come back for it. And often um, we also retail wine uh, from the restaurant and from online. Often I find that people after trying a certain wine from those mentioned places, they often want to order a few bottles for their homes, for their friends and things like that. So there is definitely an interest there. And also, you know, these countries hardly ever make any significant amount of wine. So it's not really, they have to compete with uh, giants of Italy, Spain, or France. They just need to carve themselves a small space in the whole wine universe. That's all they need to do. Exactly. And I know we all know that if you if you like something, you'll talk about it to all your friends and promote it that way. So I guess that's also one of the things to rely on the word of mouth for people who have a good experience in a restaurant. Absolutely. That's that's very important. And in the last few years, I have actually been involved in a project in Turkey where a couple of other people we are discovering varieties that have not either been used in winemaking or about to disappear. And we make small amounts of wine from it, hoping that one of the bigger guys notices those varieties and they want to get them as well. And that way we are hoping to bring some of those varieties otherwise would be lost back into the fold and that somebody with a bigger financial muscle will pick up on it and then make them a bit more planted and understood. So yeah, it never stops. Are you making notes of this, Jose? Because these are the ones you're going to be writing about next. <laughs> of course I do. I was thinking maybe you were talking about the work of Udo Hirsch in Cappadocia, is it? Uh, no, not with uh, Udo. It's a different project. This, um, this is mainly entirely uh, varieties that are about to disappear. and. But what Hugo does is very important as well. And I think he's doing a fabulous work. And what he's done there is he kept a large chunk of viticultural history alive. And I think that that has to be uploaded. Yeah, so please be, keep me informed about this project. So we have more pages in the second edition. <laughs> yeah, it's my, it's my heaviest book, I think, that, that book. <laughs> Uh, definitely mine. Oh, actually, the Napa Valley one is the biggest one. That's the heaviest one. <laughs> anyway, um, moving on, I have some questions for, for all of you. And uh, whoever would like to answer, please, please feel free to, uh, to, um, to do so. Um, in the world of wine, like all under other industries, there is a constant pendulum shift of consumer trends. So do you think that this movement away from the international varieties uh, that dominated in the 90s and 2000s to indigenous and ancestral varietals, uh, to, do you think that represents a trend or is it simply the future? Can I start? Sure. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I was very happy to hear Isabel speaking about uh, ancient varieties from the Levant, from Georgia, Armenia, and then Greece, and, and so on, to follow the path of the uh, expansion of viticulture. 
I find it fantastic. Also, being from Turkey, there is a, a huge amount of grape varieties. But what, what I have witnessed, either in Turkey, Greece, and other countries, when people want to show the world their own indigenous, indigenous grape varieties, they have the weird tendency to blend them with international ones, like local grapes plus Syrah plus Merlot. I, I can't understand that. It's not what we want. It's not what I want. What I want is what they are the only ones to make. You don't need to blend. In. If you're from Jamaica, you don't need to blend with heavy metal to make reggae. So <laughs> you, you, you need to speak to what you're doing. And, and, and to answer your question, um, I think that excessive new oak, new uh, um, over oak wines was a trend, was a fashion. But I'm convinced that the uh, use of indigenous and ancestral varieties is not a trend. It represents the future. It's back to the roots. And I constantly fight for the preservation, the promotion of local grape varieties all over the world in every country that I go. And also, I think I try to convince consumers that it is their duty to conserve this heritage. And the best way to conserve this heritage is to drink their wines. If you don't drink local grape varieties, they will disappear. So it's up to the consumers to decide. Well, I saw that a lot of people were, were smiling a bit from some of your comparisons there. I did too. And Ariana, you were, you were laughing out loud there at some point. Uh, and I know that in Sicily, there are a lot of people who do tend to blend the indigenous varietals with Syrah, with Merlot. Have you done it? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, no, I was not able to make because uh, because I think uh, it's also true that an international variety planted in a place is also able to show some character of the place because sometimes it's more the a very important place, a place very vocated in the production of wine. And usually, uh, you can you can taste you can taste limestone also in international variety. You can taste uh, uh, volcanic soil. You can taste uh, different kind. But I think we have so many richness and um, different opportunities with the local grape that is more uh, also. Um, interesting but also for us producer for me it's also very nice to experiment the different things so i want to um, experiment with the, for example in sicily we are experimenting with some grapes that we call reliquia so there is uh, there are uh, like kenzolia nera catanese nera there are unknown grape that people are, are experimenting. So maybe our future is to go to, towards this very old but uh, unknown variety to show us that the soil is put together with this variety can, can give in a wine. So for me, it's more interesting in this. So but I drank, in the past, I drank that kind of wine, of course. Some are also good, but... Uh, I think for the future, the, uh, it's not a trend, but so we have to go in that direction. So what you're saying basically is to go even deeper, even further back and find local varieties that, that still aren't known. Well, I look yeah. forward to that. You're going to blend it into the SP68? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, I saw you were laughing as well. Do you have anything you want to comment on on, on, this, uh, on this question? Not, not on this particular one, but a couple coming up. Okay, well, let's move on then. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about indigenous varieties fermented separately, yet many of the regions that have these varietals also have a long tradition of co-fermentation. So what do you see as the future of field blends? Mark? Well, um, I, I think it is very popular these days to often attack field blends as a concept. For various reasons. I mean, it can be very hard at harvest in some vintages if you have a really scattered field blend to get everything exactly where you want it in terms of 40 different grapes and things like that. That said, uh, I think 
field blends are often some of the most magnificent and interesting blends you can find. They're old vines, they're part of the history of, say, Doro. Um, and I think that will always have a place. You see a lot of producers now making monovarietals. You see a lot of producers making Torriga Nacional, Torriga Franca, that's nice. Uh, but those old great field blends from very old vines, that's part of the history and many of them are magnificent. They're often the best wines. And I, I keep coming back to Portugal as well as I just came from there. And I must say that I had a new experience for the first time I went to Portugal in the fall. And uh, when you talk about field blends and it's fall and the leaves change color, you can suddenly actually see which vines or which grapes in the in the vineyard in that field you see the different blends and that's that was magnificent so beautiful obviously you can't see that during the rest of the year when it's all green or or anything and did you say well i'm sure you have some some input on the, on that i think i think i agree with mark 100 percent i think field blend makes some of the most interesting wines amazing wines we have many examples not not so much from Portugal, both from Argentina and other places. Uh, but they are, they are very hard to, to replicate. I know, I know Quinto do Crastro, they are actually doing amazing work of, of identifying each variety and replanting each variety using GPS. Uh, and that's, that's, that's an uh, admirable, uh, admirable work that they're doing. But, I think it's very hard as also as Mark alluded to, it's a lack of control in terms of farming, in terms of uh, picking the varieties. Uh, and I don't see, uh, uh, it's a very romantic and, and story and, it, and it, it, it does, it is great to, to sell wines uh, uh, telling those stories, but I don't see many people rushing to, to do mixed planting for this lack, for, for the reason I just mentioned, lack of control. Uh, I have tried to persuade some people to, to plant to do some mixed planting, not in Portugal or elsewhere, but also there is a, there's an issue of, of plant availability at the right time, and 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 the rootstock. So logistic is is not also is not so easy, but um, there is no question they make interesting wines, but uh, I don't see enough new people uh, doing uh, mixed planting to say well that we have, we're going to have much more in the future. So the ones that are old and they are 70, 80 years old, in some cases 100 years old, I'm not sure how are people going to uh, keep them alive. It's, 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 it's great if they just keep the, the, the genetic material alive, but I don't. I just don't see many people planting. I'm not sure if Isa sees it or Jose or Mark sees. Have you experience of people actually planting? Because uh, I don't see many, sadly. Well, there are very few examples. Um, you mentioned Portugal, of course, uh, historically it's well known. There are very few regions where they have this tradition of, of uh, field blends. The ones I can think of is the famous Gemistasatz from Vienna, uh, which, which, come on, is considered as a nice little wine, never a great wine. Uh, in Switzerland, where I, where I live, we have Schiller, it's similar. And the only recent example I can think of is Jean-Michel Dice in Alsace, who is a very uh, opinionated and, and single-minded uh, wine grower. And he started to um, remake field blends like in the old days, because he's convinced that the terroir is more important than the grape variety. I can understand it to a certain point, but I, when, when he explained that to me, I said, what if you have 50% of muscat in there? Et voila. Exactly. <laughs> um, our next question here uh, is, I, I, I would direct it to Isa first, and then I think I'd like to have, especially Ariana's opinion also. Um, what have you found to be the effective strategies for communicating the unfamiliar to the consumer? I think, um, first of all, I'm talking about what I do the, from the restaurant point of view. This is not retailing and things like that. In a restaurant, what I find when you are working with varieties, wines that are not necessarily known to the consumer, 
you need to dedicate them space and you need to give them enough exposure. I, you know, you, you often see a wine list, there is like 100 wines from Bordeaux and then there is this just one wine from Greece. Inevitably, people sort of just flick through that and pass. So in, in our case, I think I've got about, including Greece, from Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, and Greece, from these four countries, I probably have about 150 wines. <laughs> so when you have such a prominent offering, it works. People you know, get curious. Yes, it works. But if I had just one wine from those countries each, I'm sure that wouldn't get the attention it gets. And so this, is, this may not be practical for everyone, uh, but also what, uh, what irritates me most is that you go to an Italian restaurant and it's full of French wines. It's like, why, you know? And then the same, you go to Turkish restaurant, it's full of wines from Chile. That's not to say Chilean wines aren't good, but it's out of context, you know? It's, it just doesn't work. If you want to sell Greek wines, first of all, Greeks has to own that. If you want to sell Turkish wines, first of all, Turks has to own that. And these are two countries, for example, with great culinary um, culture. So they are actually suitable to create restaurants and places where they serve their own food with their own wine. And there is no shortage of Turkish restaurants in most countries in Europe. So I think that's going to change. That's probably the next challenge for the Turkish wine producers or the Greek wine producers to, to address and to place their wines first and foremost in those places and then uh, grow it from there. And also both countries, th this you can include Italy to this as well. They are huge tourism countries. You know, a lot of uh, international travelers, tourists go to those countries try the food, try the wine, and they come back with memories. It's almost like in, in marketing, if you like, it's after sale service. You need to compete yeah. by, by actually making those wines available in their domestic markets so that they can revisit their holiday they had in the Mediterranean and relive some of those memories they had. I think uh, there is a lot to be done and I don't really see it as a difficult job. I think it's pretty straightforward and almost easy pickings actually. Well, I, I think that, I don't know if it's only in the northern uh, part of Europe or Scandinavia, but we've seen a renaissance of wines from the Levant uh, in the past two years actually, where it's just exploded. We have so much Greek, Greek wine these days, Lebanese, Syrian wine, not a lot, but just a few. Israeli wines, I mean, they're all really pushing forward now. We have our first wines from Cyprus, Cyprus in, in, uh, in this area. So I think that a lot of countries with indigenous varietals are finally getting there. But um, I mean, like you said, Isa, Italy is a huge wine country with, I mean, everyone knows about Italian wine. But Ariana, when you travel the world, do you remember how that was back in the day? <laughs> when, <you know? laughs> um, uh, how do you communicate your grape varietals, your indigenous grapes to consumers who are not familiar? They've heard of Sicily, but they don't know that there are local grape varieties. It's happened to me because when I started making wine, uh, I started making frappato that was uh, not in the area where I live because uh, make uh, Cera Solo di Vittoria, so the unique DOCG in Sicily. But in the world, the frappato and also Cera Solo di Vittoria were not very popular. So usually people are attracted to the new. So when you have something new, especially in the wine world. Journalists always ask me, there is new, something new, <laughs> there is new. <laughs> so people want new things. So um, uh, Frappato was not very difficult to communicate because it's so elegant and um, floral and arrived also in a period where world was going more in elegant wine, low alcohol and high acidity. But uh, it's always important as, as vineyard to make wine good. So 
the, the, the force of communication is not the only. So there is also the force to, to be able to do good wine, to convince people. So my, my way was to show something new. Um, helped, um, Frappato helped me a lot to be what I'm now because maybe with another grape, uh, uh, I was not able to make this kind of wine, but uh, I focused to show the sense of Frappato in this territory because Frappato, for example, was uh, a little bit known in that period as a wine very, very simple. I'm trying to, sh I tried at the beginning to show Frappato as a more important grape for Vittoria that could age also in barrels, age also one year and a half, but also to be able to drink after 10 years. And now I'm focused myself in the single vineyard, so uh, wine from parcel that uh, puts Frappato in another level. So not solely wine to blend, and not solely very simple wine, but a wine that show real character. So these are the, the few things uh, I use that I'm using to, to bring uh, indigenous grape. So the real things that we are able to do, it's always the best way to, to talk about wine. I agree. Um, we're moving on. We have eight minutes left. Our time always uh, runs when you have good conversations. Um, but with a return to traditional agricultural practices and a rise in the locavor moment movement, um, is a return to native varieties also a reflection of a desire uh, for a new gen generation to have a deeper connectivity to their land, uh, including looking to varieties that have centuries of traditions in their regions? Are you seeing this reflected in wine lists and food menus, uh, Isa, I'm sure you you are around much also and look at other lists. I uh, I can talk about the UK market. I'm not really that familiar with uh, other countries, and there is certainly a surging interest in UK for indigenous varieties, and I think. Um, the sommeliers are much more ready to accept that, the customers are ready. Yes, there is definitely a surge in that, and it's a welcome one as well. And uh, what about you, Mark? You, I don't know how much you travel these days, but I'm sure you did in the past. Yes, in the past, I was everywhere. Um, yes, I think so. I, I think when you meet the younger winemakers, they want to make something reflective of their culture and identity. And we talked, I forget who mentioned it first, um, with in the past, people being ashamed of their indigenous varieties and wanting to make Cabernet. And I spoke to George Scouris in Greece and he said, oh, you know, that, that was the popular thing in Greece at that time when I started the winery. That's how you make money. That's how you sold. Um, you didn't do it by making Moscafilero. Um, you know, I, I think there is a change and I think there's a new wave coming. What do you say, uh, Jose? Do you see a lot of, uh, of uh, indigenous varietals and in, in wine lists around when you travel? Honestly speaking, traveling around Europe, I cannot see a big change in general wine lists. If you are in a restaurant where the owner is a wine geek, then you can find uh, really interesting wines from local grape varieties. But you, you need to find someone who is already concerned and already aware of that. But generally speaking, from what I've seen uh, in various cities in Europe, the, the, the trend that I see is natural wine more than uh, ancestor varieties. And uh, by the way, natural wines in the, is another topic, but I think we lose the characteristics of the grape varieties with that kind of vinification. So it's another big question mark. Is it the road to go? Or I, I did not witness that. Well, coming to the last question here, I have a question for all of you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Mark. Uh, no, it was on the last question. <laughs> okay, yeah, because uh, I'd like to all of you to just very short because we don't have a lot of time left and I have a question from uh, from our uh, our uh, audience as well. But um, what was your most memorable aha moment with an indigenous varietal and uh, what, what what varietal was it? Where was it from and what did you learn from it? Mark? Well, 
uh, and again, I'll, I'll try and condense this very quickly because it's an otherwise long story, a Sirtico. And I, I think we're seeing this tie into other things we talked about today. When I first started reviewing a Sirtico around 2008, you've got a lot of people using minerality and lighter Loire style wines like a Muscadet, things like that. And then the producers started letting the alcohol rise. And suddenly a Sirtico had more aromatics, more ripeness, more flavor. And I'm not so sure by the way, that's always a good thing since it keeps rising. And I think some of them have gone over the top, but that's a longer story. But it's an aha moment because you see a grape nobody's ever heard of that's absolutely brilliant and also has different incarnations and does well in many different places in Greece and also in many different styles. Nice. Good. Isa. For me, uh, I have I've got a small sort of set of friends in back in Turkey in Izmir. And we get together a couple of times a year, that well, we used to, a couple of times a year and taste wine from all over the world. And in one of these tastings, we were tasting Barolo and Barbaresco from different vintages, different producers, including some of the, what, what is considered the top uh, wines. And in that, there was a Turkish wine uh, from 1970 vintage, and I'm talking about maybe five years ago, uh, 1970 vintage, and no one actually sussed it out. It just fit in really? perfectly, and it was one of the local Turkish varieties that, that displayed very similar character to an aged Barolo, and it just slipped through, and nobody actually recognized it as, as the local variety. And it showed me then on that day that it is possible to, a, to make wines uh, with, with potential to age uh, gracefully for many years, provided you do the right thing in the vineyard. And I don't think winemaking comes into it much, but it's the vineyard work. And I'm pleased to say in Turkey, they now understand the local varieties much better than they did before but also they also understand the importance of vineyard work. And there are few producers now really, really putting nearly 80% of their time to the vineyard. That's really nice. I, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, is, is that, I didn't get the name of the variety. No, me neither. I didn't say the variety, it was Kalejik Karase. Ah, of course. Which one? <laughs> Kalejik Karase. It, it's, a, it's a little town just just near Ankara, and they do they do make uh, they, it's a local variety from there. Um, people often think it's like Pinot, but I think it's more Grenache like than than Kalejik Karase. That's very interesting. Yeah. What about you, Dirsa? Which uh, grape variety, indigenous grape variety, gave you an aha moment? Well, before I tell my short story, I want to thank I want to thank Jose for introducing me to a variety called Gurk. <laughs> doing a symposium in the Rioja, it was the first time I tasted it. It's a variety from from Croatia, and I actually planted it in one of my projects subsequently. So it's it, it is a great variety. But my uh, my story, I was I was um, visiting the Alentejo and walking through the, the cellar with this winemaker, young winemaker. He's very very enthusiastic about uh, Trincadera. And uh, anyway, we come across this tank and he was talking about this and he said, would you like to taste it? I, I, yeah, I said, I'll taste it. And it was, it was wonderful. It just didn't have much color, but lovely acidity. It behaved almost like Pinot Noir in that case. He had a little bit of a whole bunch and, and it was fantastic. And I asked him, what, what are you gonna do with it? I said, well, I'm going to use it as a blending component as I always do. So I said, you've been telling me for the last 15 minutes about this variety. Now you're gonna, use, you're gonna just, lose it in, 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 in blending, it's, 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 it, that's, you know, if, if you really want to champion the grape, you should bottle by itself. And he thought about it. And about uh, a year later, I was in Sao Paulo doing a master class, and he came to me, top of my shoulder, said, come, I want to show you something. So he came in and showed me this bottle, and he, and he decided to bottle 100%, and it, it was fabulous. So one thing to learn is, if you're going to do it, if you make an excellent wine, if you are confident, if you package well, and if you sell at a premium, 
that's why you, you that's how you you, you sell an unusual variety not by being shy and so on so all you need to do is just do that and then as isa said earlier put on a list and there is no secret just put on people's glasses and if the wine is good it will sell that's absolutely true <laughs> i love it i've never tasted 100 percent trincadera either yeah. what about you uh, ariana do you have a, an experience with a local grape variety which wasn't italian uh, I have many um, amazing moments of testing of local uh, Italian. So I don't find now one. Uh, I remember, for example, first time I was testing the, the wine from the Collio. So the Slavia place uh, between Slovenia and Italy uh, surprised me as intense they were. But uh, yeah, I tested many, many other local indigenous and every us once sometimes I also was very surprised the first time of my life when after tasting men and Chardonnay in different parts of the world and I come back to the Chardonnay in Jura I was so surprised so the, the grape in the place where there is the best expression you know as the indigenous grape so we can consider um, a grape a ki kind of medium between uh, our choice to make wine at the terroir. When we are able to combine the two things, uh, we could be able to make a great wine. So there is usually is not important to, to work too much in the direction of the grape uh, for getting the soil or too much in the soil for getting the grape. We have to combine the two things and maybe we are able to do a very good wine. So there are so many beautiful wine from indigenous grape from Italy that I can count 100 amazing tasting. I totally agree and also we mustn't forget that the international varietals they're also local somewhere in the world they come from somewhere and they are indigenous to their own place so um, so let's not forget about those but uh, how about you Jose do you have a an aha moment that you want to share with some obscure grape variety that we haven't heard a lot about? Well, first of all, when I read your questions, um, my most memorable aha moment was when I saw them in concert, first of all. <laughs> aha. No, you're, you're too young. Ah, <laughs> they're from Norway, by the way. Yeah, of course, I know. <laughs> I like them. <laughs> no, um, no my, my most memorable moment was with the grape from Armenia. And I'm sure that Isabel knows it very well. It's Areni. Oh. Areni from... Okay. the region yeah. Wild's Zor. I was there in 2003, visiting the region, searching for uh, wild grapes growing in this area. And I was able to visit, I think it was Areni Wine Cellar or something like that. It was all dirty, all uh, ancient style, vitrification, no hygiene, no nothing. The bottles were in ceramics. And uh, I drank that on, on place. It was really, really interesting. I brought one bottle back to Switzerland and poured it to my friends. And just like Isa said about Kaleji Karasi, my friends were like, oh, that's an old Barolo, isn't it? No, it's not. It was Areni. And then years later, I met my friend Zorik Garibian, who makes Zora wines. And he spent 10 years to understand the best way to make Areni an international wine that is really up to the standards. And he managed to do that. And today his Areni is really among the best wines in the world. And I can say that the grape Areni counts among the 10 best grapes in the world. And I'm not the only one to say that. Tim Atkins agrees with me. So I'm very happy to have witnessed that. And as I'm Swiss, I must add another one. It, the grape is called Completa. Completa is from Graubünden, a small part of Switzerland. When I started getting interested in that, 20 years ago, there were 2.5 hectares and I pushed everyone and now we have 8.5 hectares. It's still nothing on the planet, but we are moving on because I really love this place. I'm so happy that you mentioned uh, Areni and uh, Zora wines because I had the exact same experience, but with Zora wines. Uh, and it wasn't that many years ago, six or seven years ago. And I was, I had no idea what it was I was tasting. Fabulous grape, I really like it too. 
We have one question from uh, from our audience here. It's not directed in anyone in particular. So I will read the question and whoever feels like answering, please do. Uh, what is your opinion on blind tasting to present, to present indigenous uh, wines amongst commonly known wines? Is that an option? Uh, wine by the glass could be a chance to introduce consumer to something new. Jose? I guess, I guess, I guess this is this is definitely one way of doing it. Uh, but it's important to put a context to it. It needs to be in context. It it shouldn't be a forced uh, practice of blind tasting. Just maybe prime them that they are getting something unusual there. Thank you. Did you want to add something, Jose? No. Okay, Mark. There, there's. A lot of grapes that people look for analogies for. And whenever you get high acidity, somewhat earthy grapes, it's popular to compare them to Nebbiolo. So in Portugal, you get Baga. In Greece, you get Sinomagro. And that's an interesting tasting to do at times. I agree. Thank you. Well, well, well uh, I, 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 serve, I serve all my wines blind at home, be it Bordeaux or Areni. Everything is self-blind because I want people to react to what's in the glass, not what's on the label, including indigenous varieties that no one can pronounce the name. I want to have the first reaction, and that's the truth in the glass. Well spoken. Well, I'll be coming to, uh, to uh, the UK shortly, uh, Isa, and uh, then you have to teach me how to, to pronounce. You just did fine there. <laughs> <laughs> you have some great varieties in Turkey that are so hard to, to pronounce. So I need you to teach me. Thank you, so much. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to join us and offer your experience and insights. Um, for those of you who are watching us, thank you so much for your uh, attention today. And I just want to give you a little heads up for our next webinar or a round table discussion, which will be next month on the 16th of November. Uh, and our topic will be road to car carbon zero. We mentioned it very briefly earlier. Uh, there was a mention of, of, um, of uh, this topic, um, but making your business less impactful on the environment, that's the, the basis of this topic. How sommeliers, restaurants are being part of the solution, prioritizing sustainable selections on the wine list, touchless wine lists, eliminating excessively packaged wines and more. And uh, with us, we will have, amongst others, uh, Honoré Comfort from California Wines and Miguel Torres Masacek. Oh, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that well. And Jeremy Ellis, a New Zealand sommelier. So hope that you will be with us again next month. Instead of a Monday that we normally do, we do Tuesday, November 16th at 3 p.m. CET. And the reason for that is basically because ASI will be uh, conducting finally a year late, but uh, still the best sommelier of Europe and Africa in Cyprus that very week. And everyone's arriving on the Monday. So I guess you will be busy traveling if uh, if you're going there uh, uh, but the tuesday on the 16th of november at 3 p.m cet we will be talking about the road to carbon zero so thank you everyone and thank you so much again to all our panelists today for taking the time and see you all in about a month's time this uh if you did join us late i also just want to say that uh, this session will be put on our youtube channel you will find it on asi psalms uh, in the coming days. So if you didn't catch all of it, you can see all of it again on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.